G'day, welcome to the Tech Math Channel. Just over four months ago, COVID-19, the coronavirus is thought to have made the leap from animals to humans for the very first time. And as our immune system has never encountered this virus before, we have no natural immunity to it as far as we know. Since then, this is where we're at. We now have 245,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus that have been reported to the World Health Organization. And tragically, we have 10,000 deaths. It's pretty much almost certain that no country is gonna be spared from this. If you have no cases in your country right now, you can guarantee that you will have. And if you only have a few cases, very, very soon you're gonna have a lot. But what we actually do right now, and what each country does right now, this is what its leaders do right now, what its citizens do right now, will make a big difference to where this number ends up. It's pretty horrible right now, but let me tell you, this will get well, well worse. But enough of that. Anyway, to the numbers. But before we do that, I just wanna say, some of the numbers I'm gonna be showing you today are fairly confronting. They're pretty alarming, be alarmed. But as I'll show you with then, with some numbers, that there is some actually hope here, that some of the numbers can be made less alarming through the actions that we take. And these are actions that need to occur right now. Okay, so to the very first alarming number, Okay, so the very, very first alarming number, well, it's an alarming graph, is this graph here. It's a total number of cases outside China. And I just want to draw your attention to this because this has huge ramifications. Now, first off, can I say a lot of other countries follow this similar growth pattern. I know where I am in Australia, it shows the same sort of growth here. The US also shows similar growth, as does the UK and plenty of other places. Italy, da 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 In fact, what you can do is you can get on either... Wikipedia or World O Meters, and you can have a look for yourself for your own country and check out the actual growth patterns. Now, what you can see here is that we are going up in an exponential growth pattern. What this means is we are not going up at adding each time, we are going up by multiplying each time. And these are really, really scary growth patterns because what you'll see is that numbers that start very small, small differences, all of a sudden start to get very, very big, very, very quickly. And I'll tell you how I mean with this. Um, okay, so we're starting back two months ago when COVID-19 first started having cases outside China. And we had cases that started, you know, we had nine cases. Uh, and all of a sudden, you see, we have differences of tens here, okay? The differences are within the tens. But exponential growth is not going to mean we're going to continue to have differences in the tens. These differences are going to start continuing. So these numbers will get bigger and bigger. This is total cases. However, this will... These, the differences get bigger, as well as the total numbers. They're all falling under exponential growth. You're going to see here, very quickly, we are now looking at hundreds each day that we are changing. Okay, this is around about mid-February. We go a little bit further, and all of a sudden, it is thousands that we're changing each day. We go a little bit further, and over here, all of a sudden, we're going up by tens of thousands each day. We go up further up here, we're going to start looking at, very soon, going up by 100,000 then we're gonna be going up by millions. And I'm talking the matter of where we're looking at weeks, not in months at the moment, we are looking at weeks. So this is a really, really important thing not to delay. You're gonna see that basically every time you delay, well, the numbers get bigger and you've got a bigger problem to deal with. In fact, we can actually see how fast this particular graph is moving and how fast the doubling is occurring. And it's pretty simple to do. What you do is the following. You look at the number of cases at the most recent here, 164,000. And you literally work out how long ago we had half of 164,000. So around about 82,000. So if we go back, one, two, three, four. Oh, around about four, four and a half days, a little over four days. Well, we've doubled since then. As you'll see, if you go back one, two, three, four, four and a bit days, that was the doubling point there. So four and a half days is roughly where we're at to double these numbers. And I'll tell you what this means. So you can see here what happens if we start on the last bit of data, we have 164,000 on the 19th of March with 10,000 deaths and we double every four days. Uh, we go to 328,000 with 20,000 deaths. Within a week, we're almost looking at 656,000 cases with 40,000 deaths. Once we go to two weeks from now, we're gonna be looking at over 2 million cases, two and a half million cases, uh, where we're looking at 160,000 deaths. Once we hit a month, the projections are a current rate of doubling. We will have almost 21 million cases. One million of those in excess will have died. So it's, look, it's one of these things where the numbers get very, very big very, very quickly. And as I can say, this has a similar growth pattern for most places uh, I've had a look at. Australia, the US, the UK, Italy, we've all had this similar growth pattern, this exponential growth pattern, where little numbers get very big very quickly. Now think about what that particularly means. Every time we double, we double the strain on our hospitals. We're gonna double the number of deaths. Every four and a half days that we wait, 
we are doubling the magnitude of this problem. We double our problem by waiting. So if you have leaders at the moment who are sitting on their hands waiting to see how things pan out, just remember every time they wait, three and a half to four days, depending on where you are, the problem doubles in magnitude. And this is not going to go away, this problem, okay? I will tell you this right now. This coronavirus isn't going to magically just disappear. In fact, I'm going to show you what will happen. The modelling is actually fairly clear on this about how epidemics spread. So what happens is that you just don't keep doubling forever. I'll give you a graph where I'll show you what actually happens. So what we have along here is we have the percent of population that is infected here. Now, it's going to go up by 20, 40, 60, 80, 100%. And that's our percentage of population who is infected. Along here, what we have is this is time. So what happens over time? What happens with a pandemic? And you're going to see that we're only down here at the moment. These numbers are going to get very, very much bigger. But when we're talking about the world's population or even the population of a single country, the numbers are huge, right? And this is what happens. We're very much down here at the moment. We're only in the hundreds of thousands. Okay. So at the moment, we're down here. <laughs> That's that exponential growth you see. So it might look like it's flat, but what's going to happen is this growth tends to keep going at that same particular pace. And then we hit around about 20%. Usually the estimations say anywhere from 20 to 40%, what happens is this growth then starts to actually fade and it begins to flatten out as what begins to happen is the virus has decreasing opportunities to infect people. And what happens then is this begins to peter out. Now this could peter out this number anywhere. We don't particularly know. The estimates where this might actually finish is anywhere from 60 to 80% of the population. It's estimated that where you will see this turning here is around about at 20 to 40% uh, of the entire population. Then you'll start to get a turning of the actual, the slowing down of this doubling. Well, you'll get a bigger space between this doubling. 20% say of the world's population, before that even occurs, we could be looking in the billions. And by the time this is finished, we're gonna be looking in the multi-billions. Okay, the next set of numbers here, just compare the seasonal flu to COVID-19. You're all pretty aware of what the flu is like and how it spreads. And so I think it's a useful comparison to have. So are we dealing with just the flu? Well, let's have a look at that. The very first thing is COVID-19. It came out four months ago, as we said, and the human body had never encountered it. As such, this thing is very, very contagious, okay? It's about twice as contagious as the flu here. It's not the most contagious thing around. Stuff like measles is much more contagious, but it's fairly out there. And that's RO number. The RO number is the basic reproduction number. It's telling you the average number of people a person who has caught the disease will infect. So for the flu, that's about 1.3. The average person who catches coronavirus infects two to two and a half people. And that's why this thing grows so quickly. The other problem we have with it, and these are scary numbers, is the flu has a one to four day incubation period. That is the time from first exposure to first symptoms. The problem with this is, and that's an on average about two, the uh, coronavirus has a one to 14 day on average about five. What this means is this gives infected people a huge amount of time to spread the disease asymptomatically before they even know they're infected. So this thing spreads because people don't even know they have it. This is the truly scary number here, is the hospitalisation rate. What you're going to see is, at the moment, the flu has a 2% hospitalisation rate. Coronavirus so far has had a 19% hospitalisation. This is known. Consider the big numbers we were looking at before and work out 19% of those numbers and you start to see the magnitude of what we're dealing with. A lot of these 19% will survive given the proper medical treatment, but they need proper medical treatment and that's a big thing, which I'll get to in a second. The other thing is the case fatality rate. Uh, this one for the flu is less than 0.1%. Uh, the fatality rate so far for coronavirus, and it's uncertain because we're still at the early stages of the epidemic, could be anywhere from one to 3.4% of the population it affects. Again, doesn't sound huge, but consider the big numbers that we're dealing with. If you have 1 billion people affected, well, 1% of that could be you have 10 million people who actually die from this disease. These numbers can get very, very big, very, very quickly. Even in a population, say the size of Australia, if we were to talk about 60% of people being infected, well, that would be about 15 million people who end up catching the disease. And then at a 1% mortality rate, and that's the lower end, we'd be looking at possibly 150,000 deaths here. This is a big thing. People are trying to treat this thing like it's a flu, and we have a leader here in Australia who pretends like it's not really happening. 
So I'm not going to go in with too much more scary numbers here. I don't want to overload you with uh, numbers and information. But what I'd recommend is this. For your own particular country, get on Worldometer or the uh, Wikipedia coronavirus by country uh, Google search and start to work out what the growth rate of your particular country is and start to look at it and decide, is your government, are people doing enough? And it's something which needs to occur really, really quickly because if you can work at the doubling rate, you will realise that things, again, the problem is doubling every four, four and a half days. So where does that leave us? We have an infectious virus, coronavirus, whose numbers double every three to four days, for which we have no natural immunity. It's a virus whose projected numbers are due to rise exponentially and will affect hundreds of millions of people worldwide within months. Anywhere from 1% to 3% mortality rate and a 19% hospitalisation rate. This means we are not going to have near enough hospitals to deal with this at the current projections. But there is something we can do. And you're all probably getting aware of this and I'm going to show you this particular graph here. Okay, the last thing I want to show you is this particular graph here. This is this idea of flattening the curve. Uh, what we have here is, and you've probably all heard of this, what we have here is this idea of what happens if this virus is allowed to continue how it is. Uh, this particular graph shows this. At the moment, we have a lot of countries which are sitting on this idea with daily new cases increasing, but they haven't maybe hit the stage where their healthcare system capacity has been exceeded yet. Some countries like Italy are already past there. Countries like Australia, we're still down here. I'm not sure where your particular country would be. That would be best off for you to determine. But anyway, what happens is, after a while, with all the new cases of people getting corona coming in, with 19% of them requiring hospitalisation, and a recovery time of anywhere up to six weeks, well, these numbers continue to rise. Even the people here are still in hospital at this particular stage. So these numbers rise, 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 rise. And what happens is we exceed the capabilities of our healthcare system. Now, without the healthcare system there to actually be able to look after the patients properly, intensive care, oxygen, things like that, because they're that busy, we will have an increase in the amount of deaths, a big increase. So it's really, really important what we do is we do this thing which is called flattening the curve. Look, everybody's still probably gonna get this disease everywhere anyway, but what's gonna happen is you want a hospital open and able to take you when you do get it. So how do we go about doing this? Now look, this is this idea of social isolation, which some countries are doing better than others. I can tell you in Australia what's happening here. Well, the first thing is we are having social distancing measures such as being told to wash our hands and keep apart from one another by 1.5 metres. Kids are still told to go into school, people are still being told to go into work. Uh, we have a Prime Minister who's also then stopped gatherings of more than 100 people, but at the same time when he said this, delayed it a couple of days so there could be a giant Hillsong rally of tens of thousands of people and a rugby game that he wanted to attend that also had tens of thousands of people there. So we're getting these very, very mixed messages. We get told not to hang out in big groups. We get told it's not really that big a concern. On top of this, as we get told not to hang out in big groups, we also have schools that are still open where thousands of kids gather today and every day all over the country mixing with one another in large groups. Uh, we get told that this is an essential service. If we don't actually have the schools running, the healthcare systems won't be able to actually work. But that doesn't really make any sense. If the kids of healthcare workers are going off to school and that's their function at the moment, what they're going to be doing is going to school and they are going to be mixing with a large number of kids where coronavirus occurs. And this large social mixing, the biggest social mixing that's still around to occur, uh, what will happen is they will go home to their parents, the healthcare workers, and they will infect them. Okay, and then you'll have healthcare workers who will be being part of the hospitalisation, the sickness and the death unable to look after the patients. The other argument that gets used is, well, at the moment also what will happen is if schools close down, grandparents will have to look after the kids and the grandparents are susceptible to the disease, but again, doesn't bear out. These numbers are increasing. At some stage, we are gonna to have to lock down in Australia. At some stage, we're going to have to, and we know this because we can see places that are further down the track, they've had to lock down. They're not doing it for a laugh. They're crashing their own economy in order to try and actually save numbers here, save numbers of people. So what will happen further on is we will end up closing up, but by that stage, more people will have coronavirus. More kids will have coronavirus. More kids will be infecting more of their health worker parents and infecting more of their grandparents. I don't know where you are in the world at the moment, but if you have a similar situation to us, you should be very, very angry and very, very scared. 
This is not just some small little thing which is going to go away. I really hope it does, but it is not looking like that at the moment. This thing is growing and it's growing fast. The sooner that we get on with measures in order to actually increase social isolation, and I'm talking big measures, China have managed to stem the size of their infections. In fact, Wuhan had no new infections the other day. But they've done a hell of a thing to do this. They've shut down businesses. They've quarantined entire places. They've tested, 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 tested. And they do testing differently to us. They test temperatures everywhere you go. You get your temperature tested. If you have a problem, if you're high temperature, you go off to a fever clinic where they work out why you have a high temperature. In Australia, what's happening at the moment? Unless you've been hanging out with somebody who is coronavirus, you are told you won't be tested. So really, we have no idea how many people have this particular disease at the moment in our country. Anyway, I did say that I'd go on a bit of a rant, but it's something to be really, really angry about. And I know this is uh, out of the style of my usual format of video. In fact, this is gonna be probably a rough and rugged sort of video. I think some of these numbers and messages need to get out really, really quickly. Anyway, wherever you are, I wish for you all the best. And for you and your family, I hope you stay safe. For your country, I hope you stay safe. This is a big, big thing. Anyway, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.